Exodus chapter 4 and verse 6. And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. So this is one of the, one of the first miracles the Most High showed unto Moses to show him who he was, to kind of give him that confidence boost, so to say, because he was calling him to deliver the nation of Israel out of Egypt. He told him to put his hand in his bosom. He put his hand in his bosom, and when he brought it out, it was leprous as snow. Now, that wouldn't have been a miracle unless Moses' skin was was dark. Moses was a dark-skinned man. Read. <clears throat> and he said, put thy hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again uh -huh. and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. So he said when he first put it in, it was turned leprous as snow. And then he put it back in and took it out. It was turned as his other flesh. Real quick, get Genesis 2 and 7, just so we can just to fully paint the picture. The Bible is written. It's our history book. When we read the Bible, it's not about nobody else but us. Read that. The book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So this is when God formed man of the dust of the ground. Go anywhere, the dust of the ground is brown. And the deeper you go, the darker the, the, darker the dirt gets. Read. And of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So that's what we see where Moses stuck his hand in his bosom. And he brought it out, it was leprous as snow. Then he put it back in and brought it out, it was back in flesh, meaning it was back to him being a brown, dark-skinned man. Go back to Deuteronomy 28. So we just read this, so this, it shall come to pass, meaning it's something going to happen to the Israelites in the future if they would not listen to the voice of the Lord God to do his commandments, that curses or bad things was going to come upon them. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, read. Verse 16, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 16. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. So one of those curses, it says, cursed shalt thou be in the city. So cursed shalt thou be in the city. You see on the slide, I don't know if you all are familiar, but you have the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre in 1921. This is what we otherwise know as Black Wall Street, where... That Black Wall Street that we had, we had, give me one second, uh, we had our own businesses. That's why it was called Black Wall Street. We had our own businesses, our own community. And one day, a young man was on the elevator with, uh, it was the, the, the uh, elevator attendant, and she accused him of transfer. And from that, every two days, there was a riot where the town was destroyed, and then bombs was dropped on the town. So this is, this is I'm going to read the article. It's an article where it says what happened. It says, when a large group of black people showed up in Tulsa to stop the lynching of a young black man unfairly accused of sexually assaulting a white female elevator operator, white crowds had been incited by incendiary unfair coverage from, from the Tulsa Tribune. A white man tried to grab a gun from a black man. A struggle ensued. The gun went off. And the white mob had the excuse to obliterate Black Wall Street over two days of brutal violence. That's pretty much it. But this, is, this was the start of the destruction of that whole city. And it, it was, that's why we hit, see on this slide the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre. That's, that's part of that curse shall thou be in the city. Uh, on the right, you had an image that says Lake Lanier, formerly known as Oscarville, Georgia. This is another city that was destroyed and then it was turned into a lake. This was our city. I'm going to read a little bit on that too. These are examples and these are just uh, small examples because when you look at across the city of Chicago, you can still see us being cursed in the city because we are, the, uh, we are at the lowest estate across the city, the areas that we live in. But regarding the Lake Lanier, it says, Prior to the groundbreaking of the reservoir in 1950, the town of Oscarville occupied the town of Oscarville occupied a part of the current location of the lake. Oscarville was a small community in the site of a 1912 lynching, which resulted in the forced displacement of all 1,100 black people 
from Forsyth County by, white, by the white residents. The black residents comprised about 10% of the population at that time. The current back black population is about 4% of the area's population. So it shows that, that, that it was a town that, was, um, that we occupied, but it was destroyed and turned into a lake, Lake Lanier. Uh, go to the next slide. Read, read 16 again. Verse 16. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. So now it says, cursed shalt thou be in the field. Our history, what you, when you examine history, we were cursed, picking cotton. And you see the young, the young child, probably about two or three years old, picking cotton. You see the, the various ages, the teenagers, the older, the parents, picking cotton, picking sugar cane, tobacco, tobago. You see us... Um, tilling the ground and the, the seven on it. All of these things happened. It was not a coincidence. All these things happened because they were prophesied in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 28, that it would come upon the Israelites. And hence, you look at our history, all of these things happened to us. Go to the next verse. <clears throat> and the next slide. Verse 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. So when it says, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store, it refers to our, the, the basket and our store. When you look at a basket, a basket is something that, that you would use, like when you look, think of a bit picnic basket. It holds, it, it's referring to our businesses, our banks, things of that nature. So the red summer, you have the red summer of 1919. I'm going to read a little bit on that. So it says, red, the Wikipedia on red summer. Red summer was a period in mid-1919 during which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots occurred in more than three dozen cities across the United States and in one rural county in Arkansas. The term Red Summer was coined by civil rights activist and author James Weldon Johnson, who had been employed as a field secretary by the National Association Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, since 1916. In 1919, he organized peaceful protests against the racial violence. In most instances, attacks consisted of white-on-black violence. Numerous African Americans fought back, notably in the Chicago and Washington, D.C. race riot, which resulted in 38 and 15 deaths respectively, along with even more injuries and extensive property, property damage in Chicago. Still, the highest number of fatalities occurred in the rural area around Elaine, Arkansas, where an estimated 100 to 240 black people and five white people were killed, an event now known as the Elaine Massacre. I'm just going to read a little bit more. It said, the anti-black riots developed from a variety of post-World War I social tensions, tensions generally related to the demobilization of both black and white members of the United States Armed First Forces following World War I, an economic slump and an increased competition in the job and housing markets between the ethnic European Americans and African Americans. The time would also be marked by labor unrest, for which certain industrialists used black people as strike breakers, further inflaming the resentment of white workers. So that's what the red summer of 1919 was, a race riot, a huge race riot that spanned across three, three, um, three cities. So. That's one instance of curse shall be thy basket and thy store. And the next one you see, the Detroit destroyed summer of 1967. So here, and I'm like I said, I'm, I'm reading bits and pieces of articles just so, because we, have, we do have a long presentation. So just reading bits and pieces of the articles, you can, as you all are hearing these things, I pray that you have notebooks where you can jot some of these things down and go and look them, look them up for yourself. If you have a Bible, grab your Bible and kind of reference it as we read through it and note these things down so that after, we, after this presentation, of course, you can ask us questions um, when we open the floor for questions, but also jot these things down so that you can look into them and know much about them. You can look them up and research it yourself in further detail. But with the, uh, the Detroit, Destroyed summer of 1967 it says when most people see the movie Detroit, it'll be like their first encounter with the events of 1967. 
when a routine bust of an after-hours drinking establishment led to five days of protests, looting, and clashes with the police. 43 people died, hundreds were injured, and thousands were arrested. Uh, so this is the, 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 uh, the author of the article. And I'm going to skip down a little bit lower into the uh, article, enforcing a racial order. Between 1910 and 1920, Detroit's black prop population grew from nearly 5,700 to nearly 41,000 people as the automobile industry flourished and low-skilled high-wage factory jobs became plentiful. Between 1940 and 1960, the black, the black population grew from 140, 149,000 to 482,000 people, about 30% of the city's population. While Detroit grew geographically to accommodate newcomers, most blacks were confined to four districts in the city until about 1960. Venturing into other neighborhoods came at a considerable risk. And I'm going to skip a little bit. It says here, for example, during Detroit's 1943 riot, riots, the police killed 17 blacks and no whites, even though white rioters vastly outnumbers their black counterparts. In some cases, the police stood by as white mobs beat blacks. And then this next section says walled off. It says relegated to segregated neighborhoods, Detroit's black residents would encounter housing shortages and substandard housing opportunities. At the tail end of the Great Depression, private developers began building new housing units in Detroit, but strictly marketed them to whites. In 1941, one such development was approved adjacent to the historically black Eight Mile and Wyoming neighborhoods. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna end there. It's a pretty long article, but here you see the Detroit destroyed summer, as we read in the beginning of the article, it was a, 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 a so-called bust on a, a legal bar. And, it, and it's, from that, it ensued into a protest, a race riot. And this is where you see, it says, curse shall be thy basket and thy store. Even in today's, today's time, you see most black businesses, one, we, don't, we don't, generally don't support each other at a higher rate. And our business, what happens to our businesses, they open, they have a grand opening, and then probably a year, two years down the line, they have a grand closing. They don't, very, they don't last very long. The reason that happens is because this right here, curse shall be thy basket and thy store. It's a curse from the Most High God. It's, it's happening to us because we are not keeping the God's commandments. These things apply to us and only us. This is, this is the Bible is black history. Uh, go back to the, go to the next slide. Verse 18. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, and in the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. So the first part of that verse, it says, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. The fruit of our body is our children. On this picture on the left, you see where it says in the caption, Spaniards killing women and children and feeding their remains to dogs. If you look closely at the picture, you'll see that. You see on the, on the left, you see a woman hanging by a noose, and then you see a child hanging right with her. And then you see the dog eating at the child's feet. The man in the middle, towards the front, you see him holding the child upside down on both hands, and dogs are eating the child's head off. Then even in the back, you see the dogs, you see the people. And you see in the very back of that picture, you see the people running, and you see the dogs chasing them. These things happened to the Native Americans when the uh, conquistadors came over here to America. These things happened. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body. Get Leviticus 26 and 20. On the right side, you see three little, three little black babies, and you see an alligator approaching them. What was that alligator? These are our children. You see on the caption, it says alligator bait on the Chag Chagres River, Panama Canal. Our children was used as gator bait. Read that real quick. The book of Leviticus, chapter 26 and verse 22. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children. So what we're reading here, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy that was written about us. Why? Because we, because we chose not to keep the commandments of God. Our children was used as alligator bait. That's black history and it's biblical prophecy. Go to the next slide. So here you see, this is still verse 18 where it says, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy 
kind and the flocks of thy sheep. On the left, you see it says Indian land for sale. You get a home of your own, easy payments, perfect title, possession within 30 days. And it says fine lands in the west, irrigated, irrig irrigable, grazing, agricultural, dry farming. So with that, with that image of the Native American on the left, I'll read a, read a little excerpt of the quick article. It says, the Dawes Act of 1887 was a United States post-Indian Wars law that illegally dissolved 90 million acres of Native lands from 1887 to 1934, signed into law by President Grover Cleveland on February 8, 1887. The Dawes Act ex expedited the cultural genocide of Native Americans. The negative effects of the Dawes Act on indigenous tribes will result in the enactment of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, the so-called Indian New Deal. So these are the things that were, these are the things that was going on. And all of this was happening. It wasn't happening because somebody just woke up one day and had a bright idea, said, hey, let's sail over to the other side. The nations knew that the Native Americans was over here. They knew who they were. They knew that they were the Israelites because the Bible prophesied that they, that they would come over here. And it's, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy land and the increase of thy kind. So on the picture on the right, what you're looking at, that, that's a mountain of buffalo that's that been murdered and slaughtered. So there's another article that goes into that. It says uh, the U.S. buffalo. Um, it says estimates of how many bison used to, sorry, it's bi I, said bu I said buffalo, is bison. It said, estimates of how many bison used, used to roam the Midwest before European settlers moved in ranged from 30 to 60 million. Native Americans once lived in harmony with these migratory herds while using the bison for food, their hides for clothing and shelter, and their bones for tools and weapons. But the American settlers advancing from the east were hungry for more land and more resources, including bison. Hunters on cross-country trains would even take aim at the wild creatures from their windows and shoot down several at a time. The hunting train would then slow to a stop for people to skin the animals for coats or cut out their tongues for culinary de delicacies in the cities along the eastern seaboard. Unlike the Native Americans, these hunters left the rest of the bison to rot. Overall, between 1800 and 1900, the bison population was brought down from the estimated 30, 30 to 60 million to approximately 325. While more exact statistics on the amount of bison killed by settlers are hard to come by, the full scope of the problem can be glimpsed in the numbers from one railroad company. 500,000 bison hides shipped east between just 1872 and 1874. So that happened, like I said, it didn't happen just because somebody woke up with idea. It happened because it was Bible prophecy. We are looking at things in history and showing you how they, are, they happened because of the Bible prophesied that they were happening. To the next slide. <clears throat> so here, verse 19. Verse 19. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. So the scripture says, cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. It's saying that you're going to be born a slave, die a slave. And if, on these images, you have Tony Thompson, born and died a slave. Matilda McCreer, transatlantic slave trade provider. I mean, survivor, I'm sorry. Zora Neale Hurston, transatlantic slave trade survivor. I mean, and curse shout that one. You're going to be born into a curse, and you're going to die cursed. You're going to be born, born as a slave, and you're going to die a slave. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Read that, verse, verse 20. Verse 20. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand unto for it to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings. Because as a people, no matter how hard we try to excel, no matter how hard we try to move forward, there's always a roadblock. There's always something that stops us, and this is why, because the, because. We didn't keep God's commandments. And as a people, it's not, it's not talking to an individual person. It's talking about the nation of Israel as a whole, the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. So go to that next slide. And these are some examples of, of, of those, these things happening, that, that cursing, vexation, and rebuke. Go to the next slide. 
So here you have Ted, Ted Landmark assaulted in Boston. You got Laquan McDonald, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Philando Castile. All these young men were assaulted, murdered for no reason. And at, that, and at the time it happened, the justice was death duty or a very light, light, light sentence. There was no judgment. There was no retribution for these young men losing their lives unwarranted. So that these things happen, and these are just four. This is just four of them. This, count, this happens countless times over the course of time. And the reason that it's happening is because the curse is in Deuteronomy 28. These, are, these events that are happening are biblical prophecy, now history. Next slide. <clears throat> Verse 21, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. So he says the, the Lord going to make the pestilence cleave unto thee. That pestilence is talking about diseases. Go to the next slide. So some of those diseases that we've seen, the H1N1 or the swine flu, that was created to... Um, to consume us off the land, the Zika virus, the Ebola outbreak, COVID-19, uh, the West Nile virus. These are very pestilences because if, if, if anybody, I don't know if anybody remembers when COVID-19 first hit, so to say, it was affecting us in the beginning stages of it. It wasn't affecting us at an alarming rate, but then some tweaks were made, and then before you know it, we were the face of COVID-19. Next slide. Verse 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sore and with blasting and with mildew and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. This is going into our, our crops. This is going into various more diseases. Uh, hemorrhoids. You got various, various diseases that plague the black community. And then where it says with an extreme burning and with the sword and with the blasting and with mildew, that's going into our crops. It says they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Read that. Verse 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under, thy, under thee shall be iron. So it says the heaven that's over you shall be brass, and the earth that's under thee shall be iron. That's talking of the heaven. That is over thy head shall be bread. Talking about us being under, under, under a rulership. But go to the next slide. Let's get some visuals on that. So that uh, heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. We had these brass. Uh, what you call that? Brass muffles across our neck. We had chains and shackles. You see on the picture on the on the left. You had the uh, our, our face being muffled. We had the. Uh, what is a rod of iron, the rod of iron around our neck. Then on the picture on the right, you see the rod of iron, and then you see the chain the, with the brass bell hanging from the waist, and then on our feet, we had the, rod, the iron. That's the heaven that is our head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. These, are, these things happen because that's how it was detailed in the Bible that it would happen to us. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is another... Uh, rod of iron that's around our neck and you see the bell. So if we tried to run, the bells would ring and they would know that one of the slaves was trying to get away. This is biblical prophecy. Go to the next slide. If you want to add something, you can. Verse 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. So now I said the Go to the next slide. The rain of our land is powder and dust. This, these two images here, you see it's the gold and cobalt mine, Democratic Republic of the Congo. There's lots of dust. It is very easy to catch colds, and we hurt all working in those coal mines. This is, this is a, uh, an example of that curse that we just read. Of, the Lord shall make the rain of our land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. And these, these things were happening, I think it's still in the 1900s, it was
was still going. So these things that were happening, you, as you read, like I said, as you read the Bible, even our history book. So when we read, as we going through these slides, these are things that happened to us as a people. And that's still happening to us today as, we look, as you examine the streets of Chicago, you examine Detroit. Every city that, we, that you go, every city across the world that you go in that we are in, wherever our neighborhood is at, you see a, a decline. Look at Chicago. You, look, you go on at various areas of where we at. The, uh, you got boarded up houses, things of that nature. Then you, when you transition to, say, the north side or various sides where we, where we may be scattered and sprinkled in, it's the, the neighborhood is a little bit better. But when you go to our neighborhood, you can see the difference. These are the things that we're reading. Uh, go back to the slides. Go to the next slide, 25. Verse 25. <clears throat> The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So as you see today, no matter where you go, we, we're scattered all across this world. And this, but this is what happened. The Lord caused our enemies to come against us, and we were smitten. When we was on the west coast of Africa, the enemy came against us, even though we made, we tried to, we went out one way to try to fight against them, and we flee seven ways before them, and we were removed and all to, into all the kingdoms of the earth. Go to the next slide. We're familiar with what we call the transatlantic slave trade, of how we got over here from the, how we got over here to the Americas from the coast of uh, west coast of Africa, but this Catalan Atlas of three thirteen seventy five, it details the routes that the Arabian during the sub-Saharan slave trade, where they took us captive and took us as slaves over in uh, Asia, Europe, um, Madagascar, across Africa. There, there was another slavery. And this slavery, even though it's not widely known, it was actually worse than the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, go to that next slide. So you see here, this is just a more clo a close-up, where you see on the on the left, you see the routes. Where you see uh, the left, the picture on the right is just a close up. Where you see uh, text that it says what was trade being traded on that route. Where you see a circle, it says gold, ivory, slaves, uh, glass, glass bead, slaves. On the top right, it's gold, slaves. Up in the top left, slaves. So that's what was going on. That's the trans-Saharan slave trade. And that was, uh, what was the year on it? Like 14, like the 14, 1375. So like I said, as we are going through these things, because, because of time's sake, we got to kind of just touch on it and keep moving. But as we saying these things, whether, you, whether you're skeptical, whether you know about things, write them down so that you can go back and look, look into it more, more, uh, in more detail. Uh, go to that next slide, <clears throat> and this is, the, this is a picture of us being removed into all the kingdoms of the world, where you see those uh, orange arrows going, from, going across the globe. This is where we were taken, from where you see here between Africa and North America from the 1500s to the 1900s. Those are the routes that we were taking. This is when this was, this was, this is when this was going on. You see in the, in the continent of Africa, you see 1700 to 1900. We were taking of Morocco, Libya, Egypt. Then on the side, you see us being taken into Asia, India, Arabia. These are, and then on the top right, you'll see the overview of the slave trade out of Africa. The number of slaves, 8 million, 4 million, 2 million, 1 million. And then it says the width, the width of routes indicates number of trans, transported. So with the bigger, the, the wider the width, the more slaves that went through that route. And that's the part of that verse we just read, said, read where it says removed into all kingdoms of the earth. Go to that next slide. <clears throat> verse 26. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth. And no man shall fray them away. Me and when they, when they killed us during that time, when the, when the conquistadors came over here and overtook this land, when they killed us, they just left us. They just left us to die 
and decay and rot. And at that time, it says, unto the beast of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. That's your uh, scavenger birds, your eagles, uh, crows came and ate the remains of our body because we, they just let dog, because they just let us lay, lay out and rot. Go to that next slide. Uh, here you see the Wounded Knee Massacre. This is where they, they murdered us and just was throwing us into a ditch to die, to decay and rot. And when, with decay and rot, you, that's when your wild beasts come, your, your birds, your, the birds of prey, so to say. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of this article real quick. Uh, it says, in the history of the European colonization of North America, an atrocity term, Indian Massacre, is a specific incident where a group of people, military, mob, or other, deliberately kill a significant number of relatively defenseless or innocent people, usually civilian non-combatants, or to the summary execution of prisoners of war. The term refers to the killings of Euro-Americans by Native Americans, Indians, as well as the killings of Native Americans by Euro-Americans and or by other Native Americans. Indian massacre is a phrase whose use and definition has evolved and expanded over time. The phrase was initially used by European colonists to describe attacks by indigenous, indigenous Americans which resulted in mass casualties. While similar attacks by colonists on Indian villages were called raids or battles, successful Indian attacks on white settlements or military posts were routinely termed massacres. Knowing very little about the native inhabitants of the American frontier, the colonists were deeply fearful, and as time passed, far more, far more white Americans eagerly consumed Indian atrocity stories around the family table and in popular literature, popular literature and newspapers that never interacted with Indians or witnessed an Indian raid. Uh, so that's, that's all I'm going to read out of there. But that's what the, look up the Wounded Knee Massacre, and you'll see we'll go in more detail. But this is a fulfillment of the prophecy that we read in the Bible. So history is Bible prophecy. Next slide. <clears throat> this is more images. You see the dogs eating, eating, the, rema eating the people. These, I ain't going to say remains. You see them fighting, not trying to fight off the dogs. This, these are dogs being uh, on the people. To destroy the Native American, the Native Indians, to be specific. And that's that, and thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. You see, you see them just sitting there, laughing, giggling, conversating how the animals are, while the beasts, the dogs, are eating up the Native Americans. Next slide. Verse 27. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch whereof thou canst not be healed. So as we go through these next, don't go to the next slide yet. As we go to these next slides, because this is more diseases and things of that nature, some of these slides, if you, if you, if you can't handle certain images, just brace yourself, because there are images of some of these, like the boils and things like that. So just want to give a, a disclaimer of the images that's going to come, that's going to follow. Go to the next slide. So it said, the scripture said, will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emrods and with the scab and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. That's the internal hemorrhoids, external hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids plague the, the black community. On the right you see these are uh, boils. Go to the next slide. But these things are not, like I said, these are not just coincidental things. All of these things that are on the earth, these are things that, are, that were unheard of prior to. These things are happening because they are Bible prophecy. What we're reading, we're connecting what the Bible says to things that happened in history. Uh, go to that next one. Verse 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. 
So go to the next slide. So it says, the Lord smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. That goes into mental health disparities, mental health disorders. Race from that results from racism, discrimination, poverty, violence. These are stressors, uh, stressors on diverse ethnic racial and race, racial groups. Uh, mental health disparities factors. Members of ethnic and racial minority groups in the U.S. face a social and economic quality that includes greater exposure to racism, discrimination, violence, and poverty, all of which take a toll on health. This is this right here, verse 28, it says, the Lord with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. This is the result of, the result of that is our communities. That's why our young men are in gangs and killing each other, killing their brother to look just like them. That's, a, that's as a result of a mental disorder being brought up and, and uh, because of an environment, they're taught to hate themselves. So in turn, they're going to hate the people that look just like them. And that's a, that's a curse. Because it says, read verse 29 again. Verse 29. <clears throat> and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. Go to the next slide. So it says, you're going to grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. If you have, a, when you think of, a, of someone that's blind, they, they have a walking stick. Well, that walking stick is what they use to make sure they don't bump into nothing or to make sure they don't run into anything. They use their uh, they ears, their other sights. Because they can't see, they use their they, they sense of uh, hearing, they use their sense of smell to get around, but they can't see anything. So they, they make their way around with their walking stick and then with their senses. So when it says, thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and it says, thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. Pull that slide back up. With all of these things that have happened to us over time, with the brutal beating of Emmett Till, um, during the Civil Rights Movement, we were, we were marching. You had the Black Panthers. You had Martin Luther King. Um, oh, what's the brother's name? This is just happened. George Floyd, what happened in, in Minneapolis. We had various marches and all of those things, but those things lasted for a small, a small amount of time. The thing went right back to normal. We didn't prosper. These things... Us marching the, the, during the time of Martin Luther King, we were doing all these things. The, our conditions didn't change. That's what the scriptures say. Thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save you. Uh, this, these are just a few images, but you've had you got Malcolm X, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, Mega Evers. It's a whole. Uh, men that tried to rise up to change the con our conditions, but yet and still, we're still here today living in downtrodden communities, living in the projects, being pushed out of the projects, and uh, what's the term? Uh, what's the red line? What's the other communities? Uh, gentrification. All of these things are happening because we are out of line with the Most High God. I also wanted to uh, point out where it says, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. As you can see right here, you have an example with Martin Luther King, and he was speaking right here. I believe this is in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was, the, you have the civil rights movement that occurred where we were trying to fight just for civil rights. And even prior to the civil rights movement, you had the Jim Crow era where they were uh, pushing all types of laws for, on us as well. So even outside of when we were so-called emancipated from slavery, we were always still going through more oppression and more hardship, okay, and more things that we had to fight for just to be treated as human beings. And it says forevermore, meaning what? These conditions were going to be on us until, which we're going to get into later, until we repent, all right? That's it. Uh, go, so, go to the next slide. I'm going to speed up a little bit. We got, still got a lot to cover. Uh, go to the next slide. Verse 30. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Go to the next slide. So that we see the first part of that verse. Troth a wife, and another man shall lie 
with her during slavery. You've seen the, the, the slave. These are images of what was going on, of the slave masters taking the slaves' wives and sleeping with them. You've seen it in the movie. If you've seen 12 Years a Slave, Roots, um, Mandingo, Rosewood, you've seen all the slave movies. That's what was going on. That's, these are the things that was happening. They would, the, the uh, slave master would have company, and then he would say, hey, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm have your wife because I'm having company, so I'm going to need your wife for this night. This, those are the things that was happening to us. And then on the, read these captions, it says, three young white men and, and a black woman. Uh, Virginian luxuries, the art is unknown. These are the things that was happening to us during the time while we were in slavery. And it happens even today. Uh, next slide. This is an image from 12 Years a Slave. These are the things, these slave movies were, were made to give a, give a visual of what happened to us when we was in slavery. And this is, this, our history is Bible prophecy as we're reading out of the Bible. And even, even so far as, go to the next slide, even so far as us doing to ourselves, we, we, I'm pretty sure everyone's aware of the Will, Will Smith and uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, I can't remember the young man's name. August Arsena. August Arsena, where he slept with Will Smith's wife. That's, a st that's still a fulfillment of this curse. These things are happening because we broke God's commandment. Go to the next slide. Verse 31. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Go to the next slide. So this is more, more images of the bison, the buffalo. You see at the top, the caption says, Gathering Buffalo Bones on the Prairie, Alberta, Canada. This conquistador came over. They just slaughtered. They just killed the animals and just pretty much obliterated them. Say it again. From the natives, they tried to starve them out. Right. Go to the next slide. More images. So what, we, what we're reading out of the Bible, you see the historical uh, images that happen as a result of it. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou, sh and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies and have none to rescue them. These are the things that was happening to us. These are biblical facts and historical facts. And we tying them, we're showing you the correlation between the two. These things didn't just happen out of, of a happenstance. They happened because they was written in the Bible. And, that, and when you read the uh, book of Isaiah 55 and 11, it says that most High says, my word will not return unto me void. So the things that we're reading out of the Bible were showing you that this is historical facts that happen. Next slide. Verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long and there shall be no might in thine hand. Go to the next slide. So during slavery, our sons and daughters were taken from us, and then not just, not just from us as the so-called blacks, but also to the, the, um, the natives, the, the Hispanics. It says peons in Puerto Rico, uh, 1898. You see our children. On the right, you see, uh, let me see. I'm going to read, see if I can read this. It says, as they are now, the mother of these children was beaten, branded, and sold at an auction because she was kind to Union soldiers. As she left for Richmond, Virginia, February 13th, 1864, bound down in a cart, she prayed, oh God, send the Yankees to take my children away. Um, some from sale for the benefit of the children. And it says, as we found them, these children were owned by Thomas White of Matthews County, Virginia, until February 20th, when Captain Riley, 6 USCI, took them and gave them to the Society of Friends to educate at the orphan shelter of Philadelphia. Profits from sale for the benefit of the children. So our children were taken away from us, and we had no military might to get them back. We had no economic might. 
and we had no political might to get our children. This happened all throughout. You had the uh, Native Americans where they had their children sent, put in boarding schools. All of these things happen because they are written in the Bible because we decided to go against what the Bible, what uh, the Most High God commanded us to do. Go to the next slide. Verse 33. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Go to the next slide. In this picture, you see this, that's sugar cane, right? You see sugar cane. Uh, no matter how much cotton we pick, no matter how many houses, no matter how much work we did on those plantations, we didn't bear the fruit of it. We didn't uh, benefit from it. Our slave masters did. We built the majority of the houses. We built, we built America, but yet we didn't, get the, uh, we didn't get to reap the benefits of those things that we did. Go to the next slide. The cotton fields. All the that we did, we stayed off in the shack while the master stayed in the big, the uh, the big plantation house, the big house. We was out, we was out in the shack, but we did all of the work. That's what this the scriptures say: the fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always, even unto this day. All of the work that we put in. We constantly call lazy, don't want to do nothing. Uh, what's some other other terms? We will, no matter how how hard we push to get ahead, we always suppressed. It's always a suppression where we can't go go that far. I ain't talking about individuals. I'm talking about as a nation, as a nation of people, we can't go where we want to go because we're always set back. Uh, go to the next slide. Verse thirty-five. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. So this next image is one of those images where it's, it's an it's a image to, to bear. So if you're not able to take um, gore or gruesome images, you, might, you may want to get a little bit, cover your eyes, peek a little bit. Go to the next slide. These are the things that was, that that was hap that happened as a result of the curses. This is where you got the uh, chicken pox, smallpox, smallpox. That's what that's what that's why that happened when they uh, so-called were vaccinating the Native Americans and they gave them smallpox. These are the things that happened as a result of the curses of God. Go to the next slide. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword. Among all nations, whether the Lord shall lead thee. So when the scripture says we are in astonishment, when when the other when other people, even us, when we see the things that happen in our communities, it's a wonder. And why is the why are these things going on? Why are we constantly having babies being shot down innocently because they got hit with a straight bullet? Why 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 are these why are young men shooting and robbing and killing each other? Why are young men standing on a standing on a block selling drugs to one another? These are an astonishment. Then it says a proverb. Go ahead. Why, why can't black people never come together? Right. Those are all. This, it's a wonder. The things that happen to us. And it says a proverb. A proverb is a wise saying. Many of the things, if you want to hide something from a, a, a Negro, put it in the book. Uh, black men are always lazy. Uh, some other ones. Black people love watermelon, fried black, chicken. Right. All of those are proverbs. And even though some of them may be true to a certain extent, why are they true? Because of the commandment, because of the, the curses that we're reading, because we broke God's commandment. And then a byword. A byword is us calling ourselves anything outside of our God-given name. We are the Israelites, but yet we call ourselves, over the, over the course of, what, 30, 40 years, we've called ourselves Afro-American, African-American, colored, uh, black, Negro, uh, on the brothers that's amongst yourself, on, each other on the streets, we call each other nigger. We call ourselves everything outside of our God-given. Because if you put, if you put 10, 10, uh, 10 black men in a room and you ask them all their nationality, you, you're bound to get 10 different answers. Why is that? Why has that happened to us? Because it's the curses. Go to the next slide. 
So this is some imagery of, of an astonishment. Young men walking down the street with their pants hanging, and this is an old image. Nowadays, you have young men, and no, no, and you had, nowadays you have young men where the pants are, are lighter than that, but they still sagging. And then on the right, you have, what's the sister name? Cardi B. Cardi B. That's Cardi B or Meg Thee Stallion? That's Cardi B. Okay. And but Meg you, Thee Stallion. That's both of them. Other nations look at us and look at us in, as an astonishment. Our music was pushed is basically baby mamas, and it's, marriage is not pushed in our community. These things are an astonishment because it takes a, 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 a strong marriage, a strong household to build a nation, and it's very scarce in our communities where you see, and I'm not saying it don't happen at all, but it's very scarce where you see a, a married couple that have been married for 40, 50, 60 years, and then they pass in that wealth of knowledge down to their children and their children are following that same example. A lot of times our children get caught up in these things because of the single parent household. Those are all things, those are an astonishment. Verse 38, thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shalt gather but little in for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. And go to this next slide. So this is that verse. All of those verses are going into us sowing seed, reaping the the uh, the, the fruits of that seed, herbs, all of those things. Even though we put in the work, we don't reap the benefits. Go to the next slide. Verse 41, thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. This, good. this correlates back with the other, the other scripture in verse 32, where our children sold, basically sold into slavery, took, stripped from us and sent to other slave owners. Go to the next slide. And then today you would know that as DSFS. That's what, DCS, DCFS. Um, that's what you would know today. Go to the next slide. This is the Leets and the Sidis in India. These are children that are slaves. You see on the, on the left, they picking up the stones, putting them in a basket to carry them. You see on the right, he carrying the stones. This is our children going into captivity. Verse 42, all thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. Next slide. So we see here the locusts eating up eating up. So with that many locusts, they're going to consume, they're going to demolish the crops. And this is what you see happen. I think it was a couple of years ago it happened in Africa. Uh, go to the next slide. Verse 43. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Meaning we're going to be in a low estate, but everybody else, every other nation around us, are going to be set on high. They're going to be able to do things. They're going to be able to come, come here. We've been here all this time. They're going to be able to come here, set up businesses, set up shop, and do things that we, we not, so it's not readily available for us. But they, they, this is what this is. Go ahead. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Showing that we're going to be the ones in a position of, uh, servitude, so to say, well, we're going to be having to go and get loans. We're going to have to go to other nations to get loans, other nations to get uh, your car note, your mortgage, various things like that. Go to the next slide. Because we don't own the banks. We got to go to the bank, which is owned by this nation, by our enemies, to get loans, to get the mortgage, to get the car note, to get the, uh, what other stuff, credit cards, all of that stuff. We don't own those things, a house. Next slide. And read, this is a Liverpool, read that real quick. Uh, Liverpool Preservation Trust, a, corn, a, corn, a cornucopia of spilling gold adorns this building on every side. I am sure it was intended as a reminder that Liverpool was built by slaves, by slavers. Money and, 
money and that its bankers grew fat off the whipped backs of Africans when they were bankrolling cargoes of strange fruit bound for the Americas. So like I said, what we're reading, we're reading out of the Bible and we're showing you that the Bible, the biblical prophecy that we're reading in Deuteronomy 28 is shown to be history. So let, let's, it, let, let's it be known that this Bible is our, this is our history book. So for black history, where it's coined just the month of February is black history, you know the Bible is our history book. And it's way more than what you could put in 28 days the shortest month of the year. Uh, go to the next slide. <clears throat> Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall, be, shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee and they shall be upon... So so just that verse 45, is, this is just a reminder that the reason that we live in a bad condition, the, hard, the harsh conditions that we face on a day-to-day -day basis at a, as the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, they are, all hap they are happening to us as a result of us not keeping the commandments of God. Read. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. And when you and think about it, these curses, that they is the curses. It says it's going to be upon thee. We know that the Bible was written to the Israelites, so the, the curses are going to be on the Israelites for a sign and for a wonder. When you think of about a sign, when, you want to, when you're going through the city, you, you know you're at Olive Harvey College because the sign says Olive Harvey College. So in the same sense, it's where you see these curses that we're going through, whatever nation of people these curses uh, you see them on, they are the Israelites. And as we're showing you, that, that points to us, our people, the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And it says, and upon thy seed forever. So as long as we are breaking God's commandments, you're going to see these uh, curses. Verse 47, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. And we did it because we did not serve God with joyfulness. Laws as being grievous when his laws are not grievous. Read. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. So here we see, go to the next slide. You got the, the SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. You got WIC. Uh, you got the local food pantry. We, got, we, we live in the conditions where we have to go to our enemies to get the food that we need. Water. When we serve them in thirst, the water. Our water supply, we got to go to the store and get Dasani. Go to the store and get Ice Mountain, the various water bottles. And then even if you, if you live in a house, you got to pay a water bill. You hand a water bill to the government. Uh, the three, you see the thread clothing. It says uh, nakedness. And nakedness for the clothing that's on our back, we got to go to our enemy to get it. We got to go to the tech because we don't own the textiles that that uh, wove the uh, cotton and the the uh, the silk and things together to make it clothing. We have to go to our enemies to get these things. These are all curses. Us being in the sub. Nor do we produce the raw material. So everything that we're going over are, are basic uh, resources that as a man or as a nation, a people should be able to provide for themselves. So God is talking about on a national level. As a nation, we are not able to provide our own selves with the things, the necessities that we need to survive, such as food, such as water, such as clothing. We all have to depend on another nation to provide them for us. That's it. So on the next slide, you see the Social Security card. When we want to, it says, in one of all things, when you have children, you got to go to your enemy to get the Social Security card, to get the birth certificate, certificate, the death certificate, the medicine for our, uh, our health, health care, education. We got to go to our enemies to get these things. Go to the next one. Uh, yokes of iron. The yokes of iron. It shows the, the thought that should be provoked. Okay, who put... Because the scripture says, 
Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send thee in hunger and thirst and in nakedness, one of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. So these yokes of iron was on our neck at one point in time. And we have to think, who put these yokes of iron on our neck? And now we're living today, they're not on our neck. That means that we are destroyed. We no longer know that we are the Israelites. We no longer know our history. We no longer know that the Bible is our history book. We no longer know these things because we have been destroyed as a people. The same way if you, had, if you ever had a dog and you had that invisible force field where they had a, um, a collar on their neck and they, when they, whenever they reached that force field, they got a shock, they got stung, and they, at, after a certain time, they, they didn't go beyond that force field because they didn't want to get shocked or stung. That's the same thing that happened to us as a people. When we was in slavery, every time we tried to run away, when they caught us, they beat us in front of the whole plantation to strike fear into the rest of the slaves so that nobody would run. And after that happened, after so many times, we no longer ran. We just said, whatever, we just, this is what it is. We here. Go to the next slide. Verse 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young. So these nations, the nations that came against us, it says they shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. They had our children, as soon as I was able to walk, they was over, they was picking cotton. They was, they was uh, helping build the house. They was doing, they were slaves. And our, our older men, if they were old and very barely could walk, they still were out there in the work. They still was out there picking the cotton. They still was out there slaving, no matter how old they were or no matter how young they were. And that's why it says a nation of fierce continents. And now it says, I want to point out, it says from the end of the, as swift as the eagle flieth, that it used that term eagle because this term is showing you the symbolism that that nation used that came against us. You know what I'm saying? So you have, in the middle, you have the United States of America. They used the eagle. You have Germany, uh, Spain. Uh, up at the top, that's France, Britain. All of these great nations, they use the eagle as their symbol. So that shows you the nations that had us in captivity, that, that the Bible coins a nation of fierce continents and our enemies. Next slide. And it says, it says, no regard for the old and the young. Here you see Atawapa. You see him being forced. It's basically... Uh, serve Christianity or die. That's basically what he's doing. That's why you see the wood on, on the bottom because they finna burn him. They finna burn him if, if he doesn't convert. And on the right, you see him being burnt because he's not. He didn't. He didn't accept that religion. Go to the next slide. You see more images. No, no regard to the old or young. You see them beaten, beaten in um. What's the uh, word when they uh? Stamp they initials on you. Branding. You see them branding the one laying on the ground. You see them beating the one standing up. And in the background, you see them beating the women. The women are trying to run away from them. They beating them. Cutting them up. And on the left, right, go ahead. Yeah, right there on the right side, you see a man that's actually about, that's grabbing a young child by his legs and about to dash his head on a big stone. That's them having no regard for the young as well. And then right here, also, you'll see where it has, I believe it's 13 men yep. that's lined up. And they did it for the symbolism of the 12 apostles and Christ. So they lined them up. So this was all portrayed by uh, the Catholic Church at this time. All right. Right. And jump up to jump up to the slide with verse 56. And then we're going to open up the floor for questions. Verse 56. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet. 
and toward her children which shall bear, for for she shall eat them for want of all things, secretly in the in the siege and straightness and where wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. When you read up with this verses that we're reading, when you read up, it goes into it's a prophecy. On, um, I think starting at verse fifty four up to fifty seven is going into a prophecy of the the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD when we were eating our, eating our children and things of that nature. But it also goes in slide. Go to the next slide <clears throat> where you see broken families and that plagues. It's, you see it says black fathers with child support debt. Uh, represents the study of 35 black fathers with a child support enforcement system in six cities across the nation. Uh, 34 is the average age of the father at the time of the study. Two is the average number of kids with child support order. 26% also care for, other, for, care for or support children other than their own. 22 is the median age of the father at the birth of, birth of first child with child support order. 71% have a high school diploma or GED or higher. 9% currently married and 74% live with relatives or partner. When you examine the Bible, that's a whole other class to go into. When you examine the Bible, we're not supposed to have children until we're married. We're not supposed to have children until the man is supposed to have his own house and be able to bring his wife into his house and then have children where he could take care of that woman, have a job and all of those things. But these things happen, broken families happen because we break God's commandments. Go to 64. <clears throat> Verse 64. <clears throat> and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. So another one of these curses is that we will be scattered among all nations. And it says we're going to serve other gods. And those other gods, it says wood and stone. That wood is talking about Christianity. Because you have that wooden cross of all of the churches of America. And then you have the false image, that false image, uh, Caesar Bolger, which you see here, is depicted as Jesus. Next slide. And these, all of these, you see on the bottom right, on no, bottom, bottom left, it says the Borgias. Uh, you may have seen this, it's a series on HBO. It's on, it's yeah, it's one on HBO Netflix. and it's on Netflix, Netflix called The Borgias. Called The Borgias that goes into the life of this guy that was it is Jesus, but he's not. Next slide. And this is here. It says, Caesar Borgia was the illegitimate son of Pope Alexander VI. Rodrigo Borgia and his long-term mistress, Venosa de Catene. He is the model for the white image of Jesus Christ, replacing the true image in lasting confusion to our people. Next slide. Verse 65. And among uh, these... Uh, go to verse 68. Verse 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. And, so, and no man shall buy you. So here we see that, again, we're reading the curses that happened to the Israelites. It says they're going to go into Egypt again with ships. We know that the ancient Israelites went into Egypt. They were in Egypt as slaves. So that's letting us know that this is that the Israelites will go into slavery again, but this time they're going to get ships. And then it says, by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. So this, this shows us that this verse is talking about the slavery that brought us over here on the shores of America and also took the Native Americans to Spain and to Europe on slave ships. And it says, and there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women. And no man shall buy you. Meaning there's no man that's going to take us out of those conditions. Like we, uh, the, no man shall save thee. No man shall buy you. Me is a quake to buy is a Quaker term meaning redeem. So next slide. So we see again with ships, that's the slave ships. <clears throat> this is biblical prophecy. Native American and Hispanic history is Bible prophecy. These are those ships we was on. Next slide. 
This is how this is a a, a, um, a drawing of how they had it mapped out how we were going to be stocked on those slave ships. Next slide. Yes. A, more clo a close up visual. If I might add too, with these slave ships, when 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 they actually began the uh, transatlantic slave trade, these ships were not designed to house people in as slaves. These ships were designed for natural resources, such as cargo, spices, rum, and raw materials. So these things were under the deck where it was not a lot of space. It was just enough space to hold in the material. But when a transatlantic slave trade began, which was ordered by uh, Pope uh, Frank Franklin or Francis, Francis I, I believe it was, in 1441, they utilized those same ships and then they started putting people in them, which was us. So you can imagine the very harsh and tight, confined spaces and conditions that we were in. Again, they weren't designed for people. They were designed for cargo, but they eventually started putting people in them. Go ahead. So with this, is it more slide? I think this is the last slide. Well, this goes further in detail, but for time's sake, we're going to skip over this. But going through this, as we see, um, well, no, we're going to read this real quick. Because this is, this is just to show how it also applied to the Native Americans. Read that real quick. Uh, the Northern Kingdom slavery. Columbus viewed the Taino themselves as a way to amass his personal wealth. He selected 500 to be exported to Spain as slaves and 500 to serve as slaves to the Spanish on the island. Columbus proudly boasted to the Spanish monarchs about the slave potential and its economic benefits. Columbus would capture and export more Indian slaves, about 5,000, than any other single individual. In addition to capturing the Indians as slaves, the Spanish also hunted the Indians for sport and slaughtered them for dog food. The Spanish also viewed Taino women as their sex slaves. So this is, this is showing how this also happened. Like that's why we say blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Black history is Hispanic history. Black history is. Go to the next slide. And these are more images of what was going on in the back, being carrying the wood on the land that they they were occupying. They were being taken over. You see on the bottom left, being them being um, branded. You see them back working as slaves. So these very same curses read in Deuteronomy 28 also applies to the natives. Next slide. Also, when you see Northern Kingdom, just for those that are not aware, when the it, Northern Kingdom is just a term, a biblical term for those that are associated as today so-called Hispanics and Native Indians. That's all. These are more, more images of, of, of them going through the same atrocities that we went through. Next slide. More images. Some of these images are duplicates of what we've seen already. Next slide. This is a native in being robbed of his wife. What we read, I think it was verse 32. Next slide. This is a, this Exodus chapter 20 and 2 proves what we read out of Deuteronomy 28, that Egypt is the house of bondage. And today, America is coined a, the spiritual Egypt. Next slide. Next slide. This is more images. Next slide. These are more, these are images of the men that where it says no man save thee. Next slide. So, so we went through all of that. This slide, so we went through all that to say, show you that black history is biblical history. Everything that we've seen in the Bible is Bible history. So you may have heard that and it may have sparked you. Okay, what do we do? What's next? What do we do? What, what's, what's the next step? Okay, I see that the Bible shows that I'm an Israelite. What's next? Go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 44. So the, the, the whole intent and purpose is to, of course, educate and show that the Bible is our history book. It, it details and outlines the things that has happened to us 
over the course of time, it details it fully. When we, when we, whenever we in a state of mind where we're not doing what God commands us to do, we're going to be facing those curses. So this is what we must do. Go to read that. The book of First Kings, chapter 8 and verse 44. 46, I'm Verse sorry. 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near. So we most have was angry with us because we still, we are here in our cap captivity. We're still here in the land where we are brought to as slaves on slave cargoes, transatlantic slave cargo ships. Read. Yet, if they shall bethink themselves in the land whether they were carried captives and repent. So it says, if you will bethink yourself to remember who you are, we, as we remember that we are the Israelites, in the land we are carried captives, it says, and repent, meaning change what you're doing, change, the behavior, change your behavior and return to keep it. Read. And make supplication unto thee and the land of them that carried them captives, saying, we have sinned and have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. Meaning that our repentance is we feel remorseful about the things that we've done against God, and then we return to him in prayer, admitting that we've done wrong. Read. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul, and the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land. So it said we, we pray unto them, him toward our land, and we said we return unto him with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul, meaning we return to reading the Bible to apply it. We return to observing the commandments so that we can apply them. Read. Which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. And when we pray, we pray to, towards the east, towards our homeland, which is Jerusalem. Read. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place. And maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. So just real quick, so we return unto him. So because of time, say just a, a few, a couple of laws that we that a couple of laws that we are supposed to keep. The book of Leviticus, chapter twenty-one, and verse five. They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. So, as men, we're supposed to be here. We, we, we grow a, we have a beard, we grow a beard, we're supposed to keep it. We're not supposed to shave off our beards as men. That's a law. And it also says, neither shall they, neither we're not supposed to shave our head bald, or we're not supposed to get cat tattoos. And that's for men and women. Uh, now go to Deuteronomy 22 and 5. No, you know what? 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. And then once we're going to read this, and then we're going to open the floor for any questions. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So we're reading... Now we're reading in the New Testament, these are still the laws of God. It's, it lets us know the order structure. That is God, Christ, man, woman. Read. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So this is, we, we're, we're dealing with two parts where the order of it, this is back to that, uh, uh, the house, the family structure. The family structure is that the man leads the household and the woman submits to the man. And it's not a, a, a slavery or right. it's not a negative connotation of the woman submitting to the man. It just means that the, it's not misogynistic. The, the man sets the tone for the household and the woman guides the house. She raises, rears the children, raises up the children when they're young. And the man is supposed to be the main breadwinner. He the one that, that, that uh, puts his foot down, in other, for lack of better terms. And he's the one that has the... The, the first and final say is set in order in the house. Um, read four again. Verse four. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Meaning that the man, whenever he with the scriptures, whenever he's praying, 
he's not supposed to have his head covered. He's not supposed to have a hat, do rag, or anything like that. Read. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. When a woman is dealing with the scriptures, learning, watching the class, she's supposed to have her head covered. Uncovered. She's supposed to have her, huh? She's supposed to have her head covered. She's supposed to have a scarf on of some sort to cover her head, showing respect for the man. Uh, so that was it, right? For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So those are two, two quick laws. Like I said, for lack of, better, lack of time, we can't go through more. But that's what we, as we are, as you hear this information, if it struck you, man, I never heard that. It's good to hear. You want to make that change? The change is made when you start keeping God's commandments. And it, it can start, it's those are the, two, the few that we brought out starts with those, and then it just builds on it as you study and continue to learn. Also, I would like to add that all the information that was brought out, um, in case anybody, it, maybe the thought may have came up, it's not a personal attack against any specific nation or anything. These are just biblical facts and historical facts that acknowledges the Bible. Okay, showing its uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Authenticity. Okay, right. so yeah, that's all. Can y'all hear me? Okay, um, so excellent job, uh, excellent job done by Semakai and Judah. We're gonna go ahead and open up the floor. Um, for questions. I know the theme uh, for this month, for Black History Month, is resistance. And hopefully with this presentation, um, it, it puts you in a mindset on, uh, how can I say, resistance, how resistant today's society can be a benefit for us. Because um, a lot of the things that we are going through now is because we didn't, quote unquote, resist the norms of this society. So uh, we're going to go ahead and open up the floor with questions. If you got a question, please unmute your mic. Or raise your hand. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, read this uh, question out loud. It's from um, uh, Faloke, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, it says, yes, excellent job by both men. So uh, all praises for that. Thank you. Uh, it says, what about all the black people that are excelling in the scripture? The last shall be first. Yes, yeah, so that's scripture. The last shall be first. <laughs> sure, sure. So, again, uh, the Bible is uh, more geared towards in a specific nation. Um, really quick. Let me get uh let me get Deuteronomy one and one. Just a uh Deuteronomy chapter one verse one. So again, I know Simakaya earlier on in the um in the presentation, he actually mentioned that, you know, in some cases you'll have individuals within our nation that were able to excel. For example, when you read throughout the scriptures, when the Israelites were uh given into slavery under the Babylonians. You had men such as Daniel, which was a eunuch, but he was set up second in command in Babylon. He had a high political power or a high political position, so therefore he had wealth, he had status, he had a name, reputation. Some of us had different, um, what would you say, uh, amenities in our captivity, but as a nation, we were on the bottom. As a nation, we went through these different curses. Um Give me another example. Even under Egypt, you had Joseph. Joseph became second in command under Egypt. But as a people, we eventually were made slaves under Egypt. So, again, the Bible is not dealing with individual peoples. Like, even if you look at today, you have some of our people that are in politics, some of our people that become congressmen, some of our people that become rich in today's world. But we can never forget that we, do, we cannot grow above our people. Our people as a nation, our status as a nation are at the bottom. But you do have some people individually that are able to excel. Okay, so again, the Bible's not dealing with us as individuals. It's dealing with us as a nation of people. You want to read that? 
This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1 and verse 1. Go ahead. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel. Unto who? All Israel. It says unto all Israel. So again, he's just dealing with us as a nation. Okay? Is that it? On, it on this side of Jordan in the wilderness. All right. That's it on that. That's it on that. Get uh, Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 1. Because that was a, that's an excellent question. It says, I think, the, what was the question again? It says, what, what about all the black people that, that excel? The thing is, I think I mentioned it earlier in the presentation as well, that the Most High God deals with us as a nation. He doesn't deal with us individually. Yeah, we have individual gifts that contribute to us building a nation. But ultimately... He deals with us as a, as a whole, as a whole nation of people. Read that real quick. This is the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2 and verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. So the scripture tells, it says, gather yourselves together. Because we, we are the nation that's not desired on the earth. So it tells us to gather together, meaning if I become successful, I'm supposed to be pulling my people with me. I'm supposed to have my, use my success as an avenue to help my nation as a whole. And, and, and we've seen it on many accounts. We can go, we're we not going to name drop. We've seen it on many accounts where that's not the case because a lot of times when our people do, and I'm not, we're not talking about uh, people giving to charities and things like that. We're talking about an uh, actual push of... Um, uplifting our nation the only way to uplift our nation is according to the commandments so that can be if you don't if you don't have an understanding of the bible that could be a very blurred line of them helping by giving money to charities and giving food to the children and things like that it says gather yourselves together and the gathering together is us gathering together keeping god's commandments first and foremost and as a nation we going the most high going to deliver us out of the state that we in read on Gath, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Verse 2, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the, sh as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So basically we're supposed to gather together under the keeping the commandments before judgment comes. Read. Verse 3, seek ye the Lord. All ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Meaning when we do this, when we keep the commandments, we're going to be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Meaning we won't be destroyed with the earth as it when that destruction comes. All right. Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. This is the book of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 30. Mm -hmm. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So the scripture says, many that shall be first shall be last, and they that are last shall be first. So the scripture is really twofold. First and foremost, it's not really dealing with us excelling as a people at all or being based as a people. This is really going into us getting the kingdom and those that were first called into this truth or first called into this uh, to, into this wisdom, us, us being the Israelites, us having to uh, keep the commandments and going out and teaching the people to keep God's commandments. That's going to be rewarded last. And those that were coming in last shall be rewarded first. So that's really what this is going into. You got anything else? Uh, this is the book of Matthew, chapter 20 and verse 16. Come on. So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Meaning what? God is going to send out this wisdom. He's going to push this wisdom throughout the earth to call a lot of people into his truth to keep his commandments. He's going to call them and make them known unto this wisdom. But there's going to be few people that follow it, that acknowledge it and take it serious and actually enter into his rest. OK, so that's what the last shall be first and the first shall be last is actually going into. All right. All right. Can we pull up the chat? Does that answer your question?
Okay. Um, scroll up. I think we had uh, Haroon Rashid. He says, what do you think about the movement that believes that the indigenous people of America are blacks and the majority of us didn't come from Africa? Yeah, so we have, get that in Ezra. So that's true. The indigenous or, or the natives, we have this book titled Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage. The Bible also, how the, the indigenous or the natives, however you want to say it, how they got here, they were already here didn't come over and discover America. It was already, it was already people living here. And that's the, that's what, when we was going through the slideshow, that's who we referenced as the Northern Kingdom. i read that. This is the book of 2nd Esdras, chapter 13 and verse 40. Those are the 10 tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea, the king whom Salmaneser, the king of Assyria, led away captives. This is when the 12 tribes split. When the kingdom was split, and you had 10 tribes that went under Rehoboam, and three tribes went under Jeroboam. And they, then this is, we fast forward, they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, and then they were, <clears throat> they were released. What we're reading right now is where they were released. Um, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Read on. And he carried them over the waters, and so they came into another land. Uh -huh. Verse 41, but they took this counsel among themselves that they will leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt. So this is where the natives or the indigenous, which we know as the, the Bible, know, we know as they, them as being a northern king. This is when they made the decision to come over to this side of the uh, earth from the so-called Middle East, as they call it today. Read. <clears throat> Verse 42, that they might keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. Read. So Verse they said they gonna, they, what they plan to do is so they can come over to this side of the earth and keep the commandments. Read. Verse 43, and they entered into the Euphrates by the narrow passages of the river. So it just so it's just the detail took to come over here, read. For the most high then showed signs for them, and hell still the flood till they were passed over. And hell still the flood, meaning the the waters. So there wasn't no hurricanes and things like that when they came over. Read. Verse 45. For <clears throat> through that country there was a great way to go. Because they went around Africa. And we came over unto this to the Western Hemisphere, read. Namely, of a year and a half. And the same region is called Arsareth. And it said the same region is called Arsareth. That Arsareth is America. Um, we're going to pull that up in a second. Where Ar Arsareth is, it's the first, 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 the first slot. Scroll up right there. All right. Pull that up on the screen. Um, so this is the JewishEncyclopedia.com. We have Arsareth, the name of the land beyond the great river, far away from the habitation of man, in which the ten tribes of Israel will dwell, observing the law of Moses until the time of restoration, according to 4th Esdras, um, or 2nd Esdras, uh, chapter 13, verse 45, Columbus identified America with this land. Columbus identified America with this land. And then real quick, I'm just going to read. Can they hear me? So I'm going to read out this book, that I, The Black Indians. This is page 26. It says, it began with Columbus. For the people of the Americas, the arrival of Columbus was hardly a blessing. On his first day, October 12, 1492, the explorer wrote in his diary, I took some of the natives by force. He later found the original inhabitants to be traceable, peaceable, no, tractable, peaceable, and concluded that there is not in the world a better nation. 
His response as a European was to say that the Indians must be made to work and adopt our ways, meaning they put them in slavery. It says, because the, the Christopher Columbus, whose unique seamanship and courage had opened the Americas to European penetration, also began the transatlantic slave trade. Read that again. It says, the Christopher Columbus, whose unique seamanship and courage had opened the Americas to European penetration, also began the transatlantic slave trade. He started by shipping 10 chained Arawak men and women to Seville, Spain. He wrote enthusiastically to King Fernandez and Queen Isabella about the business possibilities. From here, in the name of the blessed Trinity, we can send all the slaves that can be sold. When he loaded 1,100 Taino men and women aboard four, ships, four Spanish ships, the crowding and the stormy Atlantic crossing took a fearful toll. Only 300 survived, but Columbus and Spain had decided to continue the profitable slave trade from the Americas. So that's almost all I'm reading for now, but the, ind the indigenous are the Israelites. We are the same people. And notice it said in a scripture about a, a, a land where man, mankind never dwelt in 2nd Ezra, or as they said in 4th uh, Ezra. That's why the Americas was cons was considered and still is considered today as the New World. This is considered the New World. Everything on the Eastern Hemisphere was considered the Old World because man always occupied it, that land of that uh, side of the world. But in the Western Hemisphere, it was considered the New World because nobody, according to them, had occupied it. But as we can, as we read through the scriptures. The northern kingdom of Israelite of Israel or the Taino Indians, native Indians of this land, had came to this side years, many, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago. All right, which Columbus read and he knew that and how he convinced uh Spain to fund him to come on this side of the world. So did did that I don't know if you I don't know if you all are able to hear me read the excerpt from the book, but did that answer the question for you? Pull up the chat again. Could you repeat that question one more time? Okay, so so what, what we read in Deuteronomy concerning the natives of this land, the Lord was dealing with both kingdoms. So if, if, if you read, if you mention, see through the slide, you'll see things titled such as Northern Kingdom, and you probably would have saw the title such as Southern Kingdom. That's a biblical historical fact where you had the kingdom after uh, what we mentioned about Rehoboam, where he had some wrong counsel from his friend, and there was a split in the kingdom. So who, what we will refer to as the Hispanics today were considered Northern Kingdom and what would be considered as so-called blacks or African-Americans, uh, Haitians or uh, Jamaicans. They would have been considered today as or back then the Southern Kingdom. Uh, when you read and examine Deuteronomy 28, it's actually talking about two types of oppressions. One of slavery, transatlantic slave trade of being brought across from one end of the earth unto the other. But you will also read about colonization, colonialism, right, colonialism, where, they, where Europeans actually came to a land that's already previously occupied, but instead of stripping the people from the land and taking them to another place, they colonized the area and oppressed the people in their own land. So that's what you read about. See, right here we have a, uh, a depiction of natives being oppressed and sent off to slavery. Uh, but these, you see how we have Northern Kingdom him. That's just a, a, a biblical term for so-called Hispanics and Native Indians today. Their modern name is Hispanics, like Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, uh, give me some more, Guatemalans, Guatemalans um, right, Cubans, Native Americans. But their biblical name or what they would have been referred to in the Bible would have been Israel or Northern Kingdom. Or in the New Testament, they would have actually been considered Greeks or Gentiles. And 
the reason why they call Greeks, again, that's a lot of more historical stuff that we don't really have too much time to get into. But that's what's, that's pretty much the gist of what's going on. So really, the uh, when they when the transatlantic slave trade occurred, colonization or colonialism was happening here as well towards the uh, the indigenous or the northern kingdom of Israel on this land here in America. I hope that answers your question. Indeed. I just want to note because we we are the the time is still ticking and moving. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I do I do want to put it out there that our contact we have we have we we have you have additional questions. We have uh, our contact information where you can give us a call eight five five four eight four four eight four two extension seven zero one two. And then we also we uh, we are Israel United in Christ. Our school is located on the uh, west side of Chicago. You see what I'm saying? So if that's that's if we not a, for any questions that we not able to go into or we not able to go extremely in depth because there are other questions. So if you do have additional questions, you can call that number and, and we'll continue to answer if you have follow up questions to that question. All right. Can you can you put it in the chat? Yeah, we're going to put it in the chat, but it's 855-484-4842, yeah, eight, eight, five, five, four, eight, four, four, eight, four, extension 7012. And then also put the email in there as well. You can also send an email with your questions. It's iuic.chicago at israelunite.org. And that Israel is spelled I-S-R-A-E-L. All right. Um, let's go to the next question, please. Okay. So the next question is from Moniz. Uh, it states that uh, is the hope is the hope that blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans as a nation of people will come together, as so many believe. I don't see it happening because even as people find out their history, most don't care about it enough to change or repent. What about where it's written, though Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant will be saved, Romans 9 and 27. Um, there will be, a, in essence, a small amount of Israelites that will be saved. Are we talking about the whole law, which are hundreds of commandments, or the ten? So, get uh, Baruch chapter four and one. So I'm gonna start at the last, the last part about the whole law. We're talking about the whole law. You have with the laws of God, you have uh, different um, categories of the laws. You had you had the sacrificial law, which is the law that Christ came to do away with, because and hence that He died on the cross. He was a sacrifice to the nation of Israel. You have the ceremonial laws, the moral laws, the civil laws, and dietary. dietary laws. Those laws we have to keep. Uh, so read that. This is the book of Baruch, chapter 4 and verse 1. This is the book of the commandments of God and the law that endureth forever. So it says, notice it says, this is the book of the commandments of God and the law that endureth forever. So the God's laws are not done away with. We still have to keep them. Read. All they that keep it shall come to life. And read. But such as leave it shall die. So we have to keep all of the laws in the Bible. The only thing that Christ came to do away with, what we don't have to do anymore, is the sacrificial law. And you can look at Hebrews chapter 10 and read 1 through 10 that, that shows that. Um. Then, and then with the ten, with the ten commandments, the ten commandments are just an umbrella for the rest of the commandments. Because, like, thou shalt not commit, thou shalt not, thou shalt not commit adultery. Under that, you have adultery is when you commit when you have sex outside of your marriage. But also under adultery is fornication when you have sex and you're not married. You have um, bestiality, um, sodomy. Um, what else? Rape, incest, rape, the, all of those are under adultery, under that category of adultery. So when you examine the scriptures, when you have the proper understanding, the Ten Commandments 
are just an umbre umbrella for all of the other commandments that we read about within the Bible. They just go, you have the statutes and the um, the, the statutes, the, which are like the sub laws, the judgments, things like that. Now, what's the, go pull that question back up. Let's read the, what was it, 9 and 20, Romans, Romans 9, 9 and 24. 27. <clears throat> well, it says, uh, what about where it's written, though Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. So that's still just even, let's read that verse real quick. Uh, this is the book of Romans, chapter 9 and verse 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though and notice the, he said he crieth concerning Israel, which is still entails the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans that we just proved in Deuteronomy 28. He said he's talking to Israel, is addressing Israel. Read. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, uh -huh. a remnant shall be saved. So even though Israel is not the minority, because when you actually combine the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, we populate the earth more than any other nation, but it says a remnant shall be saved. So I'm going to read the definition of remnant because that remnant is still of the nation of Israel. So it says a small remnant, a small remaining quantity of something, meaning only a small, a small remaining quantity of Israel will be saved. Meaning that this, the, the read verse one in that same chapter. This is Romans chapter nine and verse one. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Verse 2. Uh, I'll read verse 4. Verse 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption uh -huh. and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? And just to, to not be long-winded for sake of time. All that is pertaining to Christ coming back and bringing back the northern, bringing back the nation of Israel back together as one. It says the glory and the covenants, the Old and New Testament, the giving of the law when Moses gave the law to the Israelites and the service of God. That's when they were doing the sacrifices and the promises was all to Israel. Read on. Verse five, who's. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh of Christ came, who is over all God blesseth forever. So showing that Christ came for the nation of Israel and pull that uh, Zephaniah 13 and 8 back up. Zechariah. Zechariah, I'm sorry. 13 and 8. Read that real quick. You can read it on the screen. He got it on the screen already. Yep. Uh, this is the book of Zechariah, chapter 13 and verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. So this is still talking about Israel. It says two parts shall be cut off and die. Read. But the third shall be left therein. So that the third, a third of Israel is that remnant that Romans 9 and 27 is talking about. So as only a third of Israel is going to be saved, even though we populate, we, 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 we are more populous in the earth than any other nation. There's only a remnant or a third of Israel that's, gonna, that's actually going to hear this information and actually change. And we already know that. We know that because that's what the Bible lets us. The Bible tells us that everybody is not going to actually care enough to change and repent. A lot of, people, a lot of our people are going to hear it and they're going to be either going to be excited and never do nothing about it or they're going to be excited and come in and go through the motions of keeping the commandments and, and drift away. But it, it's only a third that's going to actually get excited when they hear it, look more into it, and actually repent and start keeping the commandments. And that's, in essence, that's what the Bible tells us to uh, cast out the net to, and that's what we're doing. We're putting out the information for those that will hear and will repent. All right. So that was... That was it for the questions. Um, once again, if you have, uh, okay, now I do want to go ahead. So with the last the question, Baruch is in the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was removed in the late 1700s because, of, like she said here, it was removed from the, it was removed in the late 1700s by the Protestant church. And it's, it's coined as not being canon 
But like the Bible that we have here, there it go. So yep. that's the the that's the uh table of contents for the Bible that we just showed on the screen. Where you see this is the sixteen eleven Bible. You see the the new the old testament, the apocrypha, and the new testament. And this is a total of eighty books. Also I also, I'd like to point out that these are actually new categor categories that were placed in the Bible. So back in the day when we had these books, they weren't you didn't go in there and, and read Old Testament, Apocrypha or New Testament. Those are new titles that were put in the, uh, in the Bible or pages to add to kind of categorize the different time periods and things that was going on. It was always just just a list of books. If you look up the term Bible, it's a Greek word for biblios, which just means a collection of books. So it was just Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so forth and so on. There was never a actual page in, in thousands of years ago where you have Old Testament. New Testament, Apocrypha. Those are new age categories that are placed to kind of help um, organize the Bible for studiers. Okay. All right. So um, hopefully we were able to answer all your questions. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, you could give us a call. Um, the number is posted in the chat as well as the email. Um, you know, I hope we were able to educate and edify you guys. We definitely appreciate the opportunity uh, and your time as well. Uh, take the time out to whatever was brought out to research these things. Uh, look them up. They are factual. Uh, once again, we are a Bible-based uh, and historical-based uh, movement. And um, like I said, you can reach out to us via email or number to ask any other further questions. All right? Thank you for having us. Thank you. What is the nation? Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is women's support. Nation is children with role models. 